This is a lecture about minimalist running. First, a little about my background. I've been a runner since 1975. I maintain a website called intrinsicrunning.com. I have a bachelor's degree in exercise and wellness, and I'm a certified personal trainer through the American Council on Exercise. Let's start with asking the question, why is running important? Running is a very simple activity. It doesn't require a lot of equipment. It has demonstrated physical and mental health benefits. So our goal should be to try to be able to run well into old age. When defining minimalist running, we're going to look at three things. First, how we run, technique and form. Minimalist running is a skill, not a complicated skill, but nevertheless, it is a skill. Second thing is why we run for fun, for enjoyment, fulfillment, stress reduction, for health, just for feeling better. And the third thing is equipment, in this case, minimalist footwear, or sometimes no equipment, as in barefoot running. We're going to look at five benefits of minimalist running. Less impact on landing, lower injury rates, stronger feet, improved balance and proprioception, and finally, more enjoyment and reduced stress. In 2009, Harvard professor of human evolution, Dan Lieberman, conducted a study of running foot strike. He found three key findings. Um, there was a large impact spike with a barefoot heel strike. There was a smaller impact spike with a shod heel strike, presumably because with a running shoe, the cushioning at the back of the heel reduced the impact spike. However, there was no impact spike with a barefoot, forefoot landing. Many people tend to heel strike when they run, and running shoes with the built-up heel in the back tends to encourage that type of running form. However, when we take off our shoes and run barefoot, we don't heel strike because it hurts too much. We instead land on the forefoot. It's just a natural way of running when you don't have shoes on. This image is from video that uh, Dr. Lieberman produced for his study. You can see the impact spike at the point of heel contact when running barefoot. Heel striking with running shoes smooths out that impact spike due to the cushioning in the shoe. However, we see here that that impact spike is completely gone when running barefoot with a forefoot landing. Lieberman found that running with a forefoot landing style, barefoot, produced less landing impact than either heel striking with running shoes or barefoot. He also found that runners compensated for the bearing hardness of different surfaces by flexing the joints of the lower extremity. Thus, a hard surface produced no more impact than a softer surface. Professor Lieberman found that heel strikers had roughly double the rate of repetitive stress injuries, also known as overuse injuries, versus runners who landed with a forefoot pattern. Also, the force loading rate was one half in runners who were barefoot and landing on the forefoot compared with shod runners heel striking. The study was done comparing two groups of athletes. One wore conventional running shoes, which tend to be stiff, have thick built-up soles, and a lot of supportive elements. The other group wore minimalist running shoes, which are very flexible, have very thin soles, and um, are not very supportive. Now, the group in the minimalist shoes ended up showing significant gains in strength in what are called the intrinsic muscles, which are small muscles that uh, originate and insert entirely within the foot. They also showed gains in strength in the extrinsic muscles, which are those muscles that extend outside of the foot through the ankle up into the lower leg. When we run barefoot or in minimalist footwear versus heavy, thick cushion footwear, there's a lot more sensory information that comes through our feet. We can use this additional sensory information to 
maintain good running form, and in turn this can improve our balance and reduce our incidence of overuse injuries. The last benefit of minimalist running that I'm going to talk about is more enjoyment and reduced stress. This is more subjective, in other words, more qualitative than quantitative and thus uh, a little harder to measure. However, I can tell you from personal experience that when I'm landing with a forefoot landing, which produces a, a lighter, springier step, it, it simply feels a lot better than heel striking. And being able to have more ground feel, um, more sensation, assuming that's balanced with an appropriate level of protection for the type of surface that I'm running on, that just feels better too. So minimalist running, to the extent that it reduces injuries, to the extent that it feels better, uh, promotes more running. And when we run more, we in turn produce less stress. It's also a very mindful activity because it focuses our attention. When you have less protection on your feet, you really have to focus and pay attention to where you're stepping, what you're doing. This is known as mindfulness. In 2009, a friend of mine gave me the book Born to Run by Christopher McDougall, and that book changed my running and changed my life. Now, minimalist running techniques have been around for a long time. Coaches have been teaching them. However, uh, McDougall, with his book, really introduced this stuff to the masses. So I really recommend that you pick up this book. Uh, just to summarize some of the things that McDougall talked about, he talked about the Tara Humara runners of uh, northern Mexico. They live in isolated canyons uh, away from modern civilization. They have a long tradition of running very long distances and they do so with these uh, very simple homemade sandals. There are many interesting um, real characters in the book. McDougall talks about evolution and how humans are the, the greatest long distance runners. He also emphasizes that running is a skill, just like other sports involve skill, so does running, and we need to learn these skills in order to be good at it. He talks about uh, Dan Lieberman and his research at Harvard on running style, and he looks at the important role of running footwear. There's a lot of stuff in the book that goes against the conventional thinking about running. Before getting into the three components of proper running form, it's important to understand the difference between running and walking. Walking is essentially shifting body weight from one leg to the other. One foot is always touching the ground, the body weight is always being supported. Running, on the other hand, has an airborne phase. Think of running as a series of jumps. The three components of proper running technique or form are posture, cadence, and a forefoot landing. Good running form has us running tall, lined up from the head to the ankles. A slight forward lean is okay at higher speeds. You want to run relaxed and have a compact arm swing with the elbows at an acute angle. Try to avoid swinging your arms across the body center line. Most runners run with too slow a cadence, especially people who heel strike. 180 steps per minute is not something set in stone, yet I think it's a good target for people to aim for. When you have to run at that quicker cadence, it helps to prevent heel striking because you're lifting your foot off the ground and putting it back onto the ground at a fast rate. You just don't have time to reach out too far with your leading foot. And so you tend to land more towards the front of the foot instead of striking the heel. And when you're landing on the front of the foot, uh, closer to your center of gravity, your knee is more bent, you're able to dissipate that shock better. I recommend using a metronome, like this small clip-on model shown in the photo, or a metronome app that you can download onto your smartphone as a training tool. The third component of technique and form is the forefoot landing. As we saw with the Lieberman study, there's no impact spike, and the runner lands in such a way that allows the foot and the knee to flex and absorb shock. I'm going to show you now two jumping demos. Remember that running is a series of small jumps, and when we jump, we tend to land on the forefoot rather than the heel, because if we landed on the heel, it would hurt. During a properly executed jump, we land on the forefoot, 
the foot is able to flex. We're able to bend at the ankle joint, the knee joint, and the hip joint, and this all dissipates the shock properly. You can see these things occurring when I'm doing the small jumps in front of the flower bed. And when I'm jumping from a higher surface off my kitchen island, you can see these things in a more exaggerated way. Let's now look more closely at the forefoot landing, how it's done. So you want to land under the hips or not too far forward of the hips. You want to land on the ball of the foot, which I refer to as the forefoot. You want to let the heel come down and lightly touch the ground. So you don't want to keep the heel off the ground all the time. You just don't want to strike initially with the heel. Then you lift the back foot. Don't push off with the big toe. These two stick figures illustrate the difference between the desired forefoot landing compared with the heel striking with breaking. The forefoot landing enables a spring mechanism. Note that at touchdown, the knee has a greater bend compared to the other illustration with the heel striking. So a more bent knee is in a better position to flex more and it dissipates shock. Heel striking typically occurs with a straighter leg that is less able to dissipate shock. That shock is transmitted up the lower extremity through the ankles, the knees, the hips, and into the low back. We're now going to look at two different kinds of footwear and also running barefoot. Most runners are familiar with conventional running shoes. They've been around since the early 1970s. They're highly structured, lots of cushioning, elevated heel, various motion control devices, they tend to be inflexible. They also have a thick sole, it reduces ground feel, they tend to be heavy, they promote heel striking both through the reduced sensation and because of the, the thick cushioning uh, which is built up even more at the heel. This is a conventional running shoe. Note the elevated heel, also note the toe spring in which the uh, the front of the shoe kind of bends upward. Minimalist shoes, in contrast, are very light and flexible. They have a thin sole with little or no cushioning. They're zero drop, which means a, a uniform sole thickness from the front to the, the heel. They have a roomy forefoot or feature individual toe pockets. Here are two different kinds of minimalist footwear that can be used for running. Vibram five fingers and a minimalist sandal. Some would consider this to be a minimalist shoe. It does have some cushioning, but it is zero drop, and it's very light and very flexible. Running barefoot provides the maximum amount of sensation and feedback. It isn't always practical to do most of your running or all of your running barefoot. It depends on the type of surfaces that you have available to you to run on. But you always want to wear an appropriate amount of protection. I do think it's a great training tool. In fact, I don't think you can truly master proper running form without doing at least a little bit of barefoot running. We want to choose footwear that matches the conditions, such as the environmental conditions, the roughness of the terrain, but we don't want to choose footwear that goes overboard and offers too much protection. Because when we do that, we lose too much sensation and proprioception. These are important feedback mechanisms that help maintain good running form and may reduce injury risk. Thinner soles with less cushioning increase foot sensation and awareness of our form. In fact, an adequate level of proprioception and sensation is necessary to maintain proper running form. When we have good running form and increased bending of the knees, as in we do when we're running lower to the ground, we can compensate for less cushioning. The spring mechanism is modified by a proprioceptive feedback mechanism so that we always have proper shock dissipation as we move over different kinds of terrain. Smooth, clean surfaces are best for barefoot running. Christopher McDougall said in Born to Run that Barefoot runners aren't concerned so much with how hard a surface is, but rather how smooth it is, and I couldn't agree more. But I think it's also desirable 
to incorporate some rougher terrain into our training because this both reduces boredom and it challenges our eye foot coordination. Transitioning to minimalist running involves two things, form and footwear. To avoid injury while transitioning to minimalist running, a gradual approach is always best and you must also pay particular attention to practicing proper form. There are a number of strengthening exercises that will help. It's also important to work on ankle and calf flexibility. Many people lack adequate range of motion in their ankles. This is particularly true if you're used to wearing high-heeled shoes. Um, this pre-industrial civilization deep squat promotes mobility in the ankles, knees, hips, and the low back. If you're unable initially to get into this deep squat position, you can work on it gradually, and uh, when doing so, it often helps to hold on to something in front of you, like a pole. This is another illustration of the proper deep squat that you see on the far right here. This is from Vivo Barefoot. It's also an exercise drill you can do called the 100 up. There's the minor version, which has one foot on the ground at all times. There's a quicker major version, which involves spring-like actions with counterbalancing arm movements and a ball of foot landing. It's sort of like running in place. Here we see Born to Run author Christopher McDougall leading a group in the 100 up. While on hills, minimalist running form can help us run faster with less effort and with minimal impact stress during the downhill running phase. During downhill running, take advantage of gravity while minimizing propulsion and braking. Stay perpendicular to the slope as much as possible. Bring the back foot up slightly sooner. The landing foot touches the ground flatter and slightly behind the hips. During uphill running, maintain high leg turnover. Bring the knees higher, firmly drive the lead foot down and back. Running coach Bud Coates' rhythmic breathing technique isn't really part of minimalist running, but I wanted to include it anyway because I think it's very useful. So the diaphragm muscle is contracted during inhalation and relaxed during exhalation. Coates believes the greatest stress occurs when the foot landing coincides with the start of exhalation. By using a 3-2 pattern as opposed to a 2-2 pattern, that stress can be equalized across both sides of the body. With the 3-2 pattern, three foot landings occur per inhalation and two foot landings occur during exhalation. This results in the right foot landing at the start of an exhalation. The left foot landing occurs at the start of the next exhalation and so forth. Stress is shared across both sides of the body you can practice this technique with foot taps and then while walking. This lecture focused on running form and running footwear, but there are other aspects of minimalist running that you can explore, such as less reliance on technology, less emphasis on time, distance, structured workouts, big commercialized races with their high entry fees. So run as you feel, and most importantly, have fun. I hope you found this lecture useful, and if you did and you're still curious, you can find more at my website, intrinsicrunning.com.